In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the skin, which is the integumentary system, and then we're also going to look at body membranes. Now we have two basic types of body membranes that we do find inside of humans, and these are going to be epithelial membranes and then also connective tissue membranes. So we're going to look first at the epithelial membranes and talk about them. Epithelial membranes are primarily for covering or for lining. And when we use the term epithelial membrane, it's a little misleading because this is not going to be composed entirely of epithelial tissue. Instead, this is going to have definitely some epithelial tissue, but then we're also going to have some underlying connective tissues. So when you consider the fact that we've got two different types of tissues that are gonna be associated together, it's really more of an organ that we're talking about here. If we look at different classes of epithelial membranes, the first class is cutaneous membranes. Cutaneous membranes we're gonna spend a lot of time on, so here we're really just introducing them. The cutaneous membranes are the skin, or the integumentary system, and this is basically a covering of the body. It is composed of stratified squamous epithelium, and then that's gonna be overlying some dense connective tissue. So we will have num a number of different layers there, one thing that's gonna make this different from the other epithelial membranes that we look at is that this is going to be a dry membrane. The second type of epithelial membrane is the mucous membrane or mucosa. Now these are going to be composed also of some epithelium, but this is going to be overlying a loose connective tissue, and that loose connective tissue membrane is called the lamina propria. These types of membranes are going to line all body cavities that open to the exterior. So when we're talking about opening to the exterior, this is definitely gonna include the digestive tract and the respiratory tract as an example. And those are the two examples that you can see in the image here. The blue is showing us the um, mucous membranes that would be lining these tracts. And these are gonna be moist or wet membranes. They are going to be primarily designed for absorption and then also for secretion. The third type of membrane is the serous membranes. The serous membranes are composed of simple squamous epithelium and that's gonna be resting on top of a thin layer of areolar connective tissue. These are going to line body cavities that are closed to the exterior, so they don't open to the outside. And these are a little different because these are gonna have two different layers to them or they occur in pairs. And we will have a parietal layer and the parietal layer is going to line a portion of it and then that's gonna fold in and form a visceral layer. And that visceral layer will cover the outside of the organs that happen to be inside of the cavity. If we think of it like a balloon and if you put your fist into the balloon, you can get a good idea of how this is actually going to work. So the um, outer layer of it, that's the parietal layer, and then where we have it kind of punched in, that inside layer that you have, that's the visceral layer. So that would be the layer that's gonna be next to any organs that happen to be in that particular cavity. We can also have some fluid in this um, space between the two membranes, and this is called serous fluid. Um, these membranes are gonna be pretty close together, but they're still, um, most of the time, gonna have some fluid between them, and this is going to allow any organs that are in that particular cavity to be able to move around without a lot of friction on them. Here's another look at it. Um, here are two different um, serous membranes. We name them according to the cavity that they're actually lining. So again, they always have two layers. They have the parietal layer, and that would be the outermost layer, and then they have the visceral layer, which is gonna be on the inside. Um, we ha can have the parietal pericardium, and that's because it's lining the pericardium cavity. Um, and then you have the visceral pericardium as an example. So lots of different serous membranes that we do have inside of our bodies. If we talk a little bit about the connective tissue membranes, these are also called the synovial membranes. These are gonna be composed of soft areolar connective tissue. So in this case, there's no epithelium cells that you're gonna find as part of these and these um, are going to line the fibrous capsules around joints, so we can see that um, down here in this image. And in some cases, they're also lining some small sacs of connective tissue that we call bursa, and then also some tendon sheets. And with these, these are going to allow for movement of body parts without getting a lot of abrasion between the two parts. 
If we talk more now about the integumentary system, this is the cutaneous membrane or the skin that we're looking at. So first off, what are the functions of the integumentary system? It does have a lot of functions. Of course, just protection is an obvious one because this is on the outermost portion of our body, but it's more than just a blanket statement of protection. The integumentary system is really doing a lot of things for us. It is gonna protect from a whole long list of things. Um, it protects from mechanical damage. So by mechanical damage, this um, means that it is pretty rough layer um, that can withstand a lot of abrasion. It is also going to provide some cushioning because we do have multiple layers there. It is protecting against chemical damage. This would be chemicals um, such as acids and bases. And we will have a lot of sensory receptors in our skin that will help to alert us to any particular problems that there are, are um, present. There is some bacterial protection that is provided by our skin. Um, besides just being a layer that helps prevent bacteria from actually getting to our inside organs, it also um, is going to produce some antibacterial components. So they will actually help to fight off bacteria that do get onto the surface of us. There is gonna be some ultraviolet radiation protection, and that will come primarily from the different pigments that we have in our skin. There is some thermal protection, and what we mean by that is that the skin does play a big role in helping to regulate body temperature. So it will help us to cool off if we get too hot, and then it'll also help to warm us. There's some um, shivering and different things that it can do um, if we do get too cold. And then a last one is that it is going to provide some protection against desiccation. So this would mean protection against drying out. Um, it will help to keep our fluids and chemicals inside of our body. And then it also provides some protection from water seeping in as well, which is why we can go swimming for hours and not just become saturated with water in those circumstances. So the skin is involved in protecting us from a lot of different things that could cause problems for our bodies. If we list other functions of our skin, um, the regulation of body temperature is a big one. So we've got that mentioned again right here. The skin is going to help us to get rid of excess heat. Um, so if we are overheated, it will help us to get rid of that. It's also going to help us to retain heat if we are in very cold surroundings. Another thing that it's gonna do, it's going to help us to get rid of some waste molecules. We will have the ability to excrete urea and uric acid from the surface of our skins. And then also it's going to be involved in synthesizing vitamin D. So that is something that's going to happen in the presence of sunlight. If we look at the structure of the skin, the structure of the skin is basically two layers or two types of tissue. We have what's called epidermis, and this is gonna be on the outermost of our bodies. And then we have just inside that, the dermis. And so the epidermis is stratified layered epithelium, and the dermis is gonna be dense connective tissue. And we can get a good overview of these tissues or these layers in the picture that you see right here. But we do wanna look more closely at the different layers and different types of cells that we do have in these two layers. Underneath the layers, we will have what's called the hypodermis, and the hypodermis is also called the subcutaneous tissue. The hypodermis is not really part of the skin. Um, instead, this is made up of adipose tissue. This is going to anchor or tie the skin to underlying organs and underlying body components, and it's also going to provide a site for nutrient storage. Um, so this is basically fat cells. This is going to provide a place for us to store excess nutrients. And another thing that it does is it does um, provide some cushioning. So it does function in shock absorption. Um, and in that way, it will be insulating, providing protection for deeper layers of tissue. If we talk about the epidermis more, the epidermis itself is composed of five layers. Now, those five layers um, are not always all five present. So we do have um, one of them is left off of the list right here. But if you look here at this image and you look at the different blue layers that are shown, that represents layers of the epidermis. The epidermis is going to be avascular. So first off, it does not have its own blood supply. Um, instead, it's going to be relying on um, nutrients and blood from the cells that are underlying it. 
So most of the cells that we do find in the epidermis are called keratinocytes. And keratinocytes are going to be responsible for producing a lot of keratin. That keratin is going to help to strengthen and kind of waterproof our cells. If we look at the different layers and what they would be doing, um, the stratum basal is the bottom most layer of the epidermis. This one is where we're going to have our new skin cells produced. So this layer, the cells there are going to be constantly dividing and producing new cells. And as they produce those new cells, they kind of send them upward or they send them outward if you wanna look at it that way. So they will be sending them towards the very outside of our body. As they move up, these cells are um, becoming keratinocytes, they produce keratin, they move up, 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 and so they kind of pass through the different layers. And as they get higher up, they get more towards the stratum granulosum, the cells are getting flatter. You can see that by the time they get to the outermost layer, they're very, very flat. But they're basically getting flatter, flatter, flatter. The organelles that they have inside of them are deteriorating until finally we get to that outermost layer and the outermost layer is going to be pretty much dead cells. So the outermost layer of our skin, the epidermis um, layer that's the stratum cornea, that's about three quarters of the epidermis, so it's certainly the majority of the epidermis, and it's filled with dead skin cells um, and they contain keratin. So they contain that protein that's gonna provide a lot of protection for us. Um, that outermost layer contains about 20 to 30 layers of cells and that's gonna be constantly kind of shedding or flaking off the surface of our bodies. If we look more closely at a couple um, types of cells in here, we've mentioned the keratinocytes, they produce keratin, that's gonna be a fibrous protein that is going to provide a lot of the protective qualities of our skin. The melanocytes down on the bottom, these are pigment producers. These are going to be responsible for producing melanin and that is a brown pigment and as it accumulates, it does provide a lot of protection against UV light. That um, melanin is going to be kind of sent up into the layer that's just above it. So the stratum basal, um, that is where we're gonna see the melanin primarily produced. And then it kind of um, sends that up. Notice that it's going up into the next layer, the stratum spinosum. And when the melanin gets up there, notice it's forming this little U shape or little umbrella at the top of those cells. And that is gonna be so that they are basically shielding the cellular contents from any UV light that might be coming in. So that would be from the sun that is coming in. And of course, UV light can be very damaging. And so in this way, the cells are protecting themselves against the UV light. Now, as we are exposed to more and more sun, the melanocytes are gonna produce more and more pigment, so more and more melanin. And this is what we call tanning. So when we spend a lot of time out in the sun, we have a darker appearance to our um, skin, and that is because there is an extra accumulation of pigment in the cells that are their part of the integumentary system. A last cell type to point out on this slide is the blue one here in the middle, and this is the epidermal dendritic cell. These are responsible for alerting and activating the immune system in response to threats. So that is one thing that the integumentary system does do as well. Um, it does alert and respond to attacks by pathogens such as bacteria. And when we have excessive sun exposure, that is not only able to damage individual cells in the skin, but it also lowers our immune system. So it makes us more susceptible to pathogens that might be attacking our bodies. If we look closer at the most bottom layer of the integumentary system, this is the dermis. The dermis is going to contain a lot of collagen and elastic fibers. And because of this, it gives a very strong, stretchy envelope that basically surrounds the, our insides. Um, it is composed of dense connective tissue. And if we look at the layers closer here, we've got two layers to it. We have the papillary layer, which is the uppermost layer or more towards the outside. This is gonna be uneven and it has a lot of what we call dermal papillae. Those are like little fingers that stick up those are gonna stick up into the epidermis and what that's gonna do is it's going to provide nutrients to the epidermis that's just above it. 
Another thing that this uneven layer is going to do is it's going to produce um, ridges on the fingers and feet. That is basically what we know as our fingerprints. These are going to function in giving us um, the ability to kind of grasp things because we have a little bit of a ridge-like surface where we can create some friction there. The bottommost layer is called the reticular layer. Um, this is the deepest skin layer. This is going to be irregularly arranged connective tissue and fibers. And this particular layer has a lot of different components that are part of it. It does contain blood vessels, sweat and oil glands. It also has pressure receptors that help us to respond to um, different pressure that um, we might be feeling on our exterior. If we talk more about the collagen and the elastic fibers, the collagen is going to, it's a protein, it is going to provide a very tough quality um, to our skin. This is going to attract and it's going to bind water, which means that it is going to keep our skin hydrated. Now, as we age, we do not have as much collagen in our skin, and that is one reason why we tend to have um, drier and drier skin as we get older. And then as far as the elastic fibers go, they provide an elastic quality to our skin. So they allow it to stretch and then kind of go back and hold its shape again. This is something that also declines as we age. So as we age, our skin tends to become more saggy, more wrinkled, and that's a loss of that elastic quality. Now, when we're talking about the dermis, there is an abundance of blood vessels there. And having a lot of blood vessels present in the dermis, which is pretty close to the exterior of our body, is going to really help a lot with the temperature homeostasis. So one thing that it's going to allow us to do is that if we are overheated, you may have noticed before that your skin gets really flushed or it becomes pink and red. And what that's doing is it is a dilation of the capillaries that are near the surface of our body. So these capillaries that are in the dermis, and when they dilate, we have more blood kind of flowing close to the surface of our skin, and that's going to allow heat to basically be given off or released from our body. At the same time, if it's really cold outside, those are gonna constrict, they're gonna get smaller in diameter, which means we're lowering the amount of blood that's flowing close to the surface of our skin, and that's gonna help us to retain heat and kind of keep it in. So the blood vessels, their presence there in the dermis is really important for that temperature homeostasis that we have to constantly um, be taking care of.